Welcome if you're if you're just arriving, we're going to get started in just a minute. We have a great turnout today. I'll wait another beat. Hope you're enjoying your Tuesday. It's not bad out there. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Jason Vardakar. I am a Joan Tisch teaching fellow um, here at the Whitney Museum of American Art. And it's such a pleasure to be with you today to explore together, to think together about the art of Ruth Asawa, an artist perhaps new to some of you, but beloved already to many of you. And this is the first part of a two-part course. So this first part will really focus on Asawa's life and her works, will establish her corporate corpus and the stakes of the art she made during her life. And then the second part of the course will expand to consider her influences um, on other artists, including contemporary artists, as well as her influences on what I take it as the, you know, the practice of design, interior design, and also perhaps her influence on our daily life. But for now, we'll get started with this pair of images, which is perhaps and admittedly not a traditional art historical comparison, but one that is compelling to me. On the right, you'll see a group of hanging wire sculptures that Ruth Asawa has become famous for. They've become iconic. Uh, she made them throughout her life, starting around 1948. And here, um, at kind of the pinnacle of her career, they were installed permanently in the Hammond Tower, uh, lob Hammond Tower lobby of the De, De Young Museum. Um, and if you've been there, you'll know this is a concrete space. There are elevators there. A lot of uh, people kind of move through there to go up to the tower that looks over um, all of you know, the bay in San Francisco and you could see the ocean. And, and so you're kind of greeted by these dangling, these almost mysterious biomorphic works that cast long shadows and are lit in this, you know, what I take it as a very intentional chiaroscuro. They hang there, these lobed forms. Yeah, but they also move a little bit. They sway as you walk past them, like you generate a little current. So they move, they quiver and the shadows move with them, right? The shadows that are kind of duplicates um, splash on the wall, they're kind of they're a spawn, they're children, if you will, spectral, shadowy, you know, otherworldly, sure, just light, but they're there. And it almost feels when you're in this space, like you're with creatures. Um, and I'll just say almost animate ones. This is, this is how I, uh, as a scholar and as a lover of art, first encountered Ruth Asawa's work, just not knowing anything about her and happening upon this menagerie. And having not known much about her work, I could feel the stakes of it, maybe, maybe just a little bit. I could feel that maybe this was an artist who was asking us to see the world as vividly as she wanted to sculpt it that she would ask us to look in the corner of a room and see a spider dangling there. And remember that we are all webbed together in this universe of creatures, her sculptures just apart. And so I, I was preparing for this and in my kitchen um, in the corner, there was a little spider dangling in this web in the corner and that's, the photograph you see on your screen, the other one, which I do not claim to be art in any way, but which I think is a compelling way of thinking about what Ruth Asawa maybe was doing, which was helping us to see this 
spider like one of her sculptures as a present, almost a mystical form with us, right? Even though we may not notice it until we do. This spider was just there, hanging there, like a tiny Asawa sculpture. Asawa's interest in natural things spans her whole career. And we'll talk a little bit about what the term biomorphism means. Some say it's just a word, but I don't think so. I think biomorphism, that is artists' interest in the biological, whether that's a spider or, or a cell, right? Um, or a molecule or protein at a deeper level, um, has stakes in the middle of the 20th century when Asawa was kind of coming upon what will become the core of her work, kind of inventing her style. And so I wanna show you this um, sculpture she made kind of to skip ahead to 1998, uh, Ruth Asawa died in 2013, so this is a sort of a, a late sculpture and atypical. It's a cast bronze work that you see has these spikes um, kind of reaching in the air like fingers, but also almost like a sea anemone, right? Or um, like a, a piece of coral, coral reef. Um, it too casts shadows, making its duplicate, and though it's um, a hard form, as you move around it, and it is in our exhibition, um, at the Whitney on a pedestal, you'll see that the light kind of animates it, perhaps just as much as her hanging wire sculptures. But this starts with paper. Our exhibition is devoted to Asawa's lifetime interest in paper, not just drawing on paper, but making things out of paper and pushing the capacity of what paper can say. That maybe it could even remind us that the spider hangs in the corner behind us is with us. And I say that because when Asawa was a very young student, um, she started collecting these um, 19th century engravings, including the one that you see on your screen uh, by an engraver, John Pass, not so important, but look at the image that Asawa kept in a folder in her archive her entire life for like 70 years since she collected this, one of a, a set of at least three with its folds, right? Sea an enemy like here um, illustrating um, that I think ex exactly. Um, and though her collection of this engraving and the sculpture she made, you know, many, many years later are very far apart in time, I think it speaks to her consistency as an artist. But what are the stakes of this? You know, why, why should we care? So she was an artist, she was interested in nature, natural stuff. She's making this guy see the spider in the, in the corner of his kitchen. Like who cares? What are the stakes? I would argue that um, Asawa with her art makes us feel the divine, you could call it, maybe not, but just call it universal at least fabric or humanity that we all share. That her sculptures in that way are a statement of unity. And I'm gonna talk about that specifically and how that gets into the form because that might seem a little far from us at the moment, but to do so, to, to see how her sculptures might tell us about an underlying fabric an underlying humanity. I want to talk about Asawa's humanity, about her life. Um, she was born in Norwalk, California, to a family with Japanese heritage. And you see um, in the upper part of your screen a picture of her mother and father. Um, and she grew up on a farm. Uh, you can see that Asawa in 1985. So as an adult, drew a picture from memory um, of that farmstead, a kind of basic, uh, you know, wooden farmstead that uh, she was a very active participant in family life um, there. She uh, farmed strawberries and, you know, kind of common crops at the time in Norwalk in that rural California community. But it was a time um, of difficulty. You know, Asawa was born in 1926. 1926 um, 
was just three years, just to set the stage. You know, I'm just trying to set the stage. Um, 1926, her birth year was three years after US, the US Congress passed the, and it was literally called the Asian Exclusion Act in 1923, which is exactly what it sounds like. It was based on eugenic uh, science, pseudoscience that was produced and federally funded by uh, Cold Spring Harbor in, in New York State. And it was the law of the land uh, until 1967, when Lyndon B. Johnson passed the Immigration and Nationality Act and uh, signed it at, at Ellis Island, paving the way for my for my own family to even be able to come to the United States. Um, but it wasn't just the Asian Exclusion Act. Um, people with um, Asian heritage in um, uh, California were not allowed to own property, among many other exclusions and uh, structural um challenges including during the great depression you'll see the like horrific sign um in the lower left of your screen of this you know white family um just openly vitriolic and racist and I'm, by the way i'm pulling all of these images from the ruth asawa website except for the one in the lower right corner uh the asawa website uh run you know in part by the foundation by the family is fantastic there's a lot of great basic information about her um, and in the lower right of your screen, you can see just to further set the stage, this is the eugenics record office. You know, this was Cold Spring Harbor. This really happened. This was the place where they tried to prove that Asian people as a quote unquote, you know, transracial category as a false, as a fake category were unfit for American citizenship. This terror uh, reached a uh, height, um, of course, in 1941 after the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and Ruth Asawa was one of, you know, at least 140-ish thousand um, people living in America with Japanese heritage who were um, by uh, order of FDR um, concentrated into camps, uh, what have come to be called internment camps, of course. And Asawa was there with uh, her sister and her mother, you know, one day when FBI agents came to take, I've learned, you know, her father away and Asawa pressed her father's um, like best suit and shirt and, you know, made a meringue pie and like didn't see him for years. Um, she herself was taken to Santa Anita staging facility and then eventually was relocated uh, forcibly to Rower uh, internment camp. And you see this photograph um, that Asawa is in um, back row uh, far right um, from 1943. She went to high school in a barbed wire fence enclosed internment camp on a cotton field. It was shortly thereafter that Asawa got permission to leave uh, to go to Milwaukee State Teachers College. Um, however, after three years of investing her time and energy there to get a, a license to be an art teacher, um, Asawa was uh, denied the ability to complete the degree because of her Japanese heritage. And she had to find a way to somehow turn that closed door into another open one. And she, she did. Uh, she applied to the 1946 Summer Institute at Black Mountain College, uh, which was an experimental arts college. Some people call it a liberal arts college, but it was, I think it's fair to say, mainly an art school uh, with adjacent disciplines um, like the sciences, which we'll talk about. Um, and it was in, of all places, the mountains of North Carolina, you know, in the heartland of, in many ways, of the American South at the time, an extremely segregated place, of course, with little, if n almost no integration in um, education. Um, at the time when Asawa arrived to Black Mountain College, they had just in 1944 voted, and it was very contentious, to begin to integrate Black Mountain and um, they invited the first students of color there. And Asawa, I think it's fair to say, was one of the first students of color to arrive. But when she arrived, after all that, um, the locals around Black Mountain College 
protested the integration experiments by burning reportedly the woods around Black Mountain. So smoke um, filmed, you know, covered on occasion this campus where this, in a way, utopian arts community was building something. You see Asawa there with um, Ora Williams, another um, student of color invited there. And it was there that Asawa finds something, perhaps herself, and finds a voice as an artist. Um, she there collects these 19th century engravings. For example, um, the coral reef that we saw earlier, but also this, this um, Magellanic starfish. Magellanic means, means basket basket uh, starfish. And it does, right? It has these swooping, um, encircling tentacles, um, each of them that look almost like, like a basket, like a web too. A web that Asawa brought into her life, printed on this sheet of paper with its frayed edge, like a spider web. Yeah, like a fish, like a sea creature. It's polysemous. But Asawa, um, like many students at Black Mountain College, uh, is not just an art student. She has to participate in the economy and the culture of that place. And so uh, she takes up a lot of tasks. She, she does laundry, for example. Uh, she washes sheets and things like that in the Black Mountain College laundry room. And she makes uh, a number of works, including the one you see at your right, that um, are on paper again, but have the stamp, the BMC Black Mountain College stamp that here is arranged in this tentacular way, right? Almost like an octopus with its flinging arms. I'm impressing that on that, sure. But, and it's a, a forced comparison and also not. We have to think like, okay, if I'm reading that geometric BMC uh, stamp work she made as kind of tentacular as fish, starfish-like or something. At the same time, like probably right on her desk, she was known to have a really messy studio there, like was this engraving. I think of it in that way, like these two pieces of paper at the beginning of something. And in 1947, Ruth Asawa goes to um, Mexico, to Toluca, Mexico, where she um, learns a basket crocheting uh, technique uh, from some locals there in which they were taking rows of wire and interlooping them to create these baskets that hold eggs. And she makes this work um, probably on the campus of Black Mountain College that is, and this work is now in the Asheville Museum. And you can see it, I think of it as kind of a a revelation. It's the first, I think, or maybe the first surviving um, wire sculpture, if you'll call it that. And I think I think of it that way that Asawa made. And again, I think of it in relation to the basket starfish, the um, Magellanic starfish engraving that she had right there, and then maybe on her desktop. Not just uh, a utilitarian object, a basket, something that you know you you uh, put on a shelf or put some uh, oranges in, but perhaps something more like a form, a basket that maybe suggests a vessel, gestation maybe, but also maybe just the very fact of holding things, holding anything in this gossamer web, like a spider web, a basket catches if you will, human food, right, contains it, like the spider catches the bug. The web is its, in a way, basket. Asawa was making the basket work and thinking about perhaps these organic creatures at exactly the same time that she was studying molecular biology, of all things. Um, See, at Black Mountain College, they wanted their students to learn some of the, what were understood as like secrets of the universe, uh, 
secrets and wonders in the order of nature. And Asawa took a biology class in which she learned about, for example, how all plants and animals, humans are made from the same thing in a way, um, cells. And they talked about mitosis and Asawa in 1948 and 49, uh, began drawing the process of cells undergoing mitosis. In the far right, you can see uh, these cells, right, departing in this exquisite moment of one becoming two, right, of doubling. This is a, its center is a, a tear from or an image from a, a textbook that Asawa likely encountered while she was a student at Black Mountain College in this biology class. And you can see there's this form these two cells undergoing mitosis covered in this layer almost mesh like of skin um that is all these these little tiny particles right microscopic that make up these building blocks of life and it is at precisely the same time that asawa makes her first hanging wire sculpture that you can see bears significant um, resonance with these forms that she encountered at Black Mountain College in biology. These two lobes that are departing in this, again, exquisite moment of mitosis, one becoming two, duplication, replication, held together, right, by this thread, uh, which is, I think, where we get the word mitosis. I think mitosis means thread, I believe. Like, the these in a way, it's defined by this moment of, of doubleness, of two things connected as one, of connection, connection itself. So if this is a breakthrough sculpture, it perhaps is, um, you know, a little bit at least, about some kind of fundamental connection, not just between cells, but maybe, you know, between all living things, I would say. And I, I, I want to explore Asawa's work in that, in those terms, and think more clearly about the stakes of this. Like, why does this matter? Like, okay, this is interesting, but why does this really matter? Well, um, at this very moment in time, in 48, 49, um, World War II has ended, and the first um, news reports uh, that are very public and widespread um, are circulating about what had really happened during World War II. Um, the world is grappling with the uh, facts of the Holocaust. And the world is also grappling with widespread systemic racism, including in the United States. Um, uh, segregation, of course, is, is, is rampant there. And uh, there's a hard look uh, taken by many of the allies, um, uh, who had won the war, many in Europe, but internationally, um, to try to consider what is the problem and how do we move beyond um, the horrors, the terrors wrecked on humanity by racism. And an organization, of course you'll know, called the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, forms to in part deal with this problem. UNESCO in 1949 issues what they call the first statement on race. And you can see in the UNESCO courier here at center, they're quote unquote, uh, exposing the fallacies of racism. And it's a flawed statement for sure, but that is what they were attempting at that time to do. But they were attempting to do it, UNESCO, in this first statement on race in a particular way. They were looking to molecular biology. They were looking to um, cells, DNA, molecules, the fabric that makes us all the same to prove in their own way that race as a concept was untenable. That in other words, differences were creating hatred that shouldn't be validated because according to UNESCO in their first statement on race, science proved that we are cut from the same cloth, that we are at at least some fundamental level equal. In the context of Asawa's life, her journey, I think it's fair to say that um, her first hanging wire sculptures, departing cells, if you see them in that way, but at least 
objects, sculptures that recall perhaps an infinite sense of replication, duplication, bubbling lava lamp in and out of each other gets to something of that, that we are all made in a way of these bubbling organic forms. These biomorphisms therefore have a deeper maybe meaning. And you can see at left, this is a sculpture owned by the Whitney Museum, I believe, yes. Uh, I hope so, yes, <laughs> and um, is a lovely work that gets just to this, these interpenetrating lobes, right? Lava lamp like bubbling in and out of each other that are also continuous. They like the root word of mitosis, right? A, a mitosis, a thread. They are threaded, they are bound together. These are not uh, different uh, pieces that uh, uh, orbs, mesh orbs that, uh, that hang separately. No, they're they're literally continuously woven together such that one thread um, makes the entire thing inner, inner and outer. Um, they're not component parts, in other words, like maybe us. Asawa is not the only sculptor thinking in these terms, in these universal, and I would say kind of anti-racist, I would say also uh, pro-human, uh, you know, fabric terms. I would say absolutely universalist terms. I'm not scared of that word, universalist. I think it's beautiful. And I think that Asa Usama, uh, is Isamu Noguchi, excuse me, Isamu Noguchi's excellent, in my opinion, sculpture, The Self, um, from 1956, uh, right at the time when Asawa was making many of her hanging wire sculptures, gets also to this. It's uh, entitled The Self, yes, but it also looks strikingly, if you look at biological diagrams, like a folding chromosome, um, uh, an image that was circulated a lot at that time as it was a moment when the whole world was looking to many of the discoveries made in molecular biology, which we take a lot for granted now, but which at the time were very new and exciting. Um, and to just put a finer point on this too, uh, this isn't just about science being popular. Like it was right then and there where Asawa was studying um, because, you know, like Einstein was on the board of Black Mountain College, you know, uh, there, there were scientists who were deeply involved and invested in what a modern arts curriculum could do. And, and there was thought that maybe science could really help um uh speak to a greater um greater meaning that art could get to and i think noguchi does that himself a man with japanese heritage who had a complicated relationship to his quote unquote race um that failed concept you know he called himself for example in a document eurasian quote unquote um is i think here in this abstract perhaps chromosomal way getting to some deeper particle underneath skin, bones, flesh that makes us all stardust, the self that is all of us. Part of the intellectual history of this is that starting around the 1930s, um, there is this rush among scholars, not just in the sciences, the hard sciences, but also in the humanities to kind of zoom in on the world. Uh, it's called sometimes like a molecularization of thought. Like people are really looking at the 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 um the tiniest, the atomic in a way, um, as a way to think about the universal. That's not exactly a new theme. That's in a, in some ways a very romantic, like 19th century way of thinking about the world, but it reaches its new height when, for example, um Watson and Crick, uh, you know, uh along with the undercredited, um, of course, uh, uh, Rosalind Franklin uh, discovered the structure of DNA. And you see Franklin is pictured here along with, I'll call it here, her model and her X-ray images. Um, and why am I putting this up? Like, why does this... <laughs> what is Asawa? What, why Rosalind Franklin and Asawa? What's happening here? Well, you know... Maybe nothing, but I can't help but think that in Asawa's wire crochet technique, there are rows of loops that meet with a parallel row of loops, that these loops wrap around each other in a double helix-like form, and that she spent her entire life 
making these double helices with her crochet technique at precisely this time. We are all made of this, that dream, that stuff we can't see, that fabric that makes us all us, that we can never really explain, but that Rosalind Franklin was able to capture for a second. Asawa's investment in the underlying orders of nature that bind us is not just biological, although I think the biomorphism here is important. It's also mathematical and many other things. And um, I want to make science not so rote and boring, but actually um, expand a little bit to consider the kind of Willy Wonka likeness of this. Uh, because it is, it's very Willy Wonka. Um, it's whimsical. Uh, and I say that because when Ruth Asawa was studying at Black Mountain College, she wasn't just taking biology, but she she was also studying with um, uh, a very famous scientist, a mathematician, very famous mathematician named Max Den, who, like many of the faculty members uh, at Black Mountain, had uh, fled Nazi uh, uh, persecution and come to the United States and uh, found a post at Black Mountain College, and. Max Den was famous in his field, but on the campus with all these mostly sort of liberal arts students, although there were some serious math students too, I believe, um, Den would go on walks with students like Ruth Asawa, I believe. And he would he would have a notebook and I imagine him, I'm just setting the scene, like Max Den, this, this mathematician would look up at the trees on the wooded campus and he would like take out his notebook and start uh, jotting things down and show the math of the fractals and tetrahedrons and how um, nature had ordered itself in these miraculous ways. Asawa at the same time was making these almost sine curve like, um, I've heard them described as uh, Joseph Albert studies, perhaps, or Fuller studies, but I don't know what they are. What I know is that these are almost translucent sheets of paper that still exist in the Stanford University archive that, you know, you I, at least I don't know if they're still protected, but I could touch with my hands like these studies, so delicate pencil graphite on paper. And just being with them in the archive, it almost felt like I could feel Asawa's presence there, like her hand moving across the pages, these unidentified leaves marked maybe with her human oil, with her, her life, her movement, her gesture. I'm sorry, I don't mean to romanticize them, but I keep returning to them because to me, they're, they're something of that, some mysterious objects unnamed, which are present for me and present for me, perhaps in the same way that I think about in my own head, like Max Den, the mathematician there teaching Asawa, her thinking about these beautiful fractal-like forms and wondering maybe, I imagine this young woman there wondering what orders the universe and what does it all look like? Um, I have this quote here from Warren Weaver, who was uh, kind of the head of the uh, Rockefeller Institute um, in Manhattan that contributed to a lot of the molecular biology in its moment. And I think it captures something of the mysticism I see in these works. Like, why do we know such more about atoms than we do about men? Warren Weaver said this hope um, that molecular biology could explain some deeper meaning behind us. And um, while these are, of course, artworks, there's something of that atomic structural exploration in these. Asawa was not just studying science. She was also studying with world-renowned artists who too had uh, fled Nazi persecution, including Joseph Albers, whose wife, uh, the celebrated and accomplished uh, artist weaver Annie Albers, um, had Jewish heritage. They um, left, they came to Black Mountain College and Albers was a star teacher there. And uh, at right, you can see a photograph of Albers and he's um, he's 
a teacher who is immediately invested in the importance of paper. He wanted his students to understand what he would sometimes call like the, the heartbeat, you know, or the pulse of paper, something Asawa also deeply understood. And they were really, uh, there's a lot of chemistry, like um, academic chemistry between them. Asawa loved Albers and Albers, uh, you know, felt like Asawa was one of his favorite students. And um, you can see here, there's this paper fold uh, study. Albers is teaching his students. He, he really wanted to understand paper as not just a uh, a platform or, you know, uh, a ground, but as a substance. If you folded paper on two angles and, you know, you you uh, pushed it up, how could it form these uh, malleable um, uh, shapes that could breathe almost like a living creature? It could be refolded and unfolded again, could move, could move in the wind. To me, these are Max Den-like or biological in some way forms that make it into, for example, uh, the UNESCO headquarters. And this is something I think a lot about, that when UNESCO built its headquarters and inaugurated in 1958, um, they turned to our Marcel Brouwer, who, like uh, Joseph Albers, had studied, had, you know, studied at the Bauhaus for stars of the Bauhaus, and who had been trained by Walter Gropius. Um, and so we're really invested in um, these kind of, I would call, say like very um, economic forms that uh, you might find in nature that um, were repeatable, fractal-like, um, that had a, an organic relationship to the body and to use and to daily life, um, if you know the Bauhaus school. And so I think Albers was coming out of that. And I don't think it's a, a random occurrence that UNESCO turns to these perhaps universalist form makers. Uh, you can see like the folded paper, right? That Albers cranes over is not so different from that um, portico that Brouwer famously um, designs for the UNESCO headquarters in Paris. And I think that these geometries, if they come from nature in some way, if we could call this a kind of biomorphic adjacency, the stakes of it, especially in the context of UNESCO, might be what we're circling here, which is a statement of equality in the face of difficulty, of racism, of horror. Um, Ruth Asawa herself remarked that when Joseph Albers talked about art, um, he talked about democracy. He, he talked about, about equality, that um, Albers was invested in how forms could themselves have a sense of balance of democracy in them that I think can be read as a metaphor for a politics, yes, but maybe a bigger, a larger statement about an underlying quality in us all. And what a perfect form for UNESCO to get interested in um, forms that state equality and democracy. The Whitney Museum itself hires um, Marcel Brouwer, uh, or we occupy this space um, for a very long time that you see on your screen uh, to images, one of the, the lobby and um, another of a gallery that um, on the left, you can see is filled with perhaps other, you could interpret them as biomorphic forms like a calder uh, mobile, which hangs above the image, but also uh, if, you, if you're familiar with the artist Seymour Lipton, whose biomorphic works are kind of these stacked columns. And Seymour Lipton, the artist was interested in thinking about these stacked orbs as perhaps cellular or replicable in some way. And I think too of um, Brouwer's iconic um, kind of circular lights, right, in the lobby of the Whitney Museum that you see at right, that maybe are not so, so different than the idea of a fractal or a replicated cell. Um, that is the, again, you know, fabric, the cloth from which we are all cut. These statements in art, I take them as metaphors for a deeper sense of equality, a universalism that is more than just, um, you know, repeatable and familiar modernist forms. It has high, high stakes. Um, Ruth Asawa herself engaged with some of these um, 
exercises in a democratic form, to use Albert's word. This is a study that Ruth Asawa made in one of Albert's classes. And um, she, you can see, is um, kind of making these what are called Greek meander forms, black and white, tumble and gyrate in this very organic, almost lichen-like form, right? Um, that for Asawa was um, certainly a, the study of a student, and Albers really loved this, this work in particular, but also a study, and again, I'm going to say like democracy equality in, in the form, the black balancing the white, and the Greek meander here, which is that kind of uh, curl, um, is, is supposed to be constituted both by its inner and outer curl in equivalency. So these kind of forms of equivalency or duplication or replication um, may be akin to Asawa's uh, you know, original sculpture pulling apart. Another uh, artist that Asawa studied with at Black Mountain College uh, really caps this, I would call it like whimsical but high stakes uh, world in the on the wooded campus of studying art uh, with this, this man, uh, Buckminster Fuller, um, who Asawa said, you know, just arrived on campus um, one day when he, with his in his uh, Dymaxion car uh, filled with these eccentric mathematical diagrams. And there you see he is with his car. He was interested in, you know, efficiency and how math could um, create these very economic, democratic, equalizing technologies that um, would would solve a lot of human problems, waste problems, things things like that. And um, Elaine de Kooning, who was a student at Black Mountain College, and Asawa actually like made, um, uh, um, well, anyways. Um, in any case, uh, I'll read uh, Elaine de Kooning's uh, description of of of. He was affectionately called Bucky. Um, Bucky whirled off into his talk using bobby pins, clothespins, all sorts of units from the five and 10 cent store to make geometric mobile constructions, collapsing an ingeniously uh, fashioned icosahedron by twisting it and doubling it and tripling the modules down to a tetrahedron, uh, talking about the obsolescence of the square, the cube, extolling the numbers nine and three, the circle, the triangle, the tetrahedron, and the sphere, dazzling us uh, with co his complex theories of ecology, uh, engineering, and technology. He began to make diagrams. Uh, here's our old friend, the hypotenuse. You can imagine this Willy Wonka-like character, right, coming with all his diagrams and math. And Asawa loved Bucky um, as a mentor throughout her whole life. Bucky actually made uh, Ruth Asawa's wedding ring when she married Albert Lanier, and um, you can see it at right. And I don't think I'm off base to suggest that it also has these kind of universal forms embedded in it. It's round, circular, infinite, with the many crossing of the A's for Albert and Asawa uh, forming the clasping silver rose that are forever joined in this symmetry, orbital symmetry. The stakes of this are high for Asawa. Like I said, they're equalizing, but they're more than that. I think they bring us to our own time. Um, at left is a uh, work that Albers also really loved that Asawa made at Black Mountain College that shows perhaps these kind of cellular or bubble-like forms that perhaps prefigure her famous wire sculptures. This work on paper though, that um, is covered in this in this um, oil and opaque watercolor, right? Allowing the paper to kind of sop up, soak in, if you will, on um, that liquid. And it's a very saturated work that in a way um, kind of pictures um, the process of those like, oil and paint bubbles, right? Like uh, bleeding into the paper itself, as if Asawa is painting at a molecular scale what the paint is doing on the page. Um, a kind of beautiful uh, way of making art, at least to me, about art. And she did think of these as dancers, so maybe that's a good way to think about it too, as, as oil or, or paint dancing across the page. Um, it's been said that you know it's the it's the raised arms of a dancer, and I see that, but perhaps there's more. And at at right, I have a photograph um, of bubbles, you know, um, from my own house, like coming out of this this tube, um, just because like 
like the spider in the corner. These forms are all around us all the time. These Buckminster Fuller-like, these Asawa-like forms that are geodesic, that are spherical, that are efficient, that are miraculous, and that are also made of the molecules, the invisible particles that we are all made of. Wanders in the order of nature that Asawa, I think, makes us see, takes yet another form in making works that are not just on paper, but out of paper. For example, the very striking, at least to me, wall-mounted paper fold with horizontal stripes from 1951. So just shortly after she makes her first, her um, breakthrough hanging wire sculpture with its lobes departing in mitosis, if you will, I like to think of this in perhaps similar terms, like this huge piece of paper already an organic substance, right? Already um, made from pulp, from cells, from a tree, right? Perhaps, or from rice or from um, whatever constitutes that material in its moment that she inks with this perhaps uh, carbon-based ink right, in these stripes, and that, that she folds, and you can see her at right folding meticulously, into this order. An order that, whether we like it or not, we are all subject to. Like, we are all organized by some laws, some patterns, that science only reaches in the dark to describe. In 1951, we hardly knew the structure of DNA. Today, we can hardly understand half of what makes us tick. I think of these paper folds as, in some way, metaphors for us, for our skin cells, for our skin, for us um, in our just basic state of being, which is always somehow organized, folded by some being we know not, but which maybe art can help us to see. It is anyways, leaf-like, like foliage, like the exfoliation of skin, or perhaps cell-like. It's polysemous, like many of her works, abstract, could be a raccoon pelt, could be many things. But it is its polysemousness, its biomorphicness, I think, that gets to the underlying structures that we all are. And it is made, too, of that, of carbon, right, and, and pulp cells in its own way. Asawa saw the infinite possibilities here. She would fold uh, paper kind of infinitely, like a skin, like a snake skin that always sheds. And here you can see her husband, Albert Lanier, sitting in front of a paper fold screen that Asawa designed for a showroom. She continued this process, and I show you that to show you the, the always possible expanding paper world, the web she spun, even into an activist practice for Asawa had like a whole second career as we conclude the first part of this course, which was as a as a, an arts activist, as a teacher in San Francisco public schools, where she ran a very successful and, and nationally renowned after school program for the arts, really pioneered it. And you can see her here, not just making art in her studio apart from the world, but in it, bringing her very organic sense of the possibilities of this material to the children in this classroom, doing something very much similar to what she learned from Joseph Albers, that paper can be folded and unfolded, refolded, reconstituted, that it is a democratic in a way, a webbing in a way, material. Asawa also made many ink works on paper that to me, 
are very intimate. The so many thousands of tiny dots she laid on a piece of paper like this to make this um, what was probably a, a, a an image of a kind of a desert plant that a friend brought her in the 1960s from Joshua Tree that she had trouble drawing. She was interested in the problem of it. It's many organized complexities, this kind of tumbleweed like form that here you can see Asawa makes ordered with her so many touches of her pen on this the six-pointed star at center. The work you can see is slightly amorphous, slightly asymmetrical, but still, nonetheless, is organized. It has at its center a star, six-pointed, you know, yeah, but that with the negative space, with the lines, reaches out in so many different directions, like a growing branch, um, set of branches you know, perhaps a, a metaphor in some way for a center, for a for a six-pointed star at the center of, of I, I sound ridiculous, but, you know, like everything in, in a way, everything. Um, and, you know, not to wax poetic, but that is true. Like, we are all, if you believe it, stardust from the Big Bang. Like we all started as a tiny, infinitesimally small point that somehow made the whole universe. Maybe. And, and we're here anyways. And we're all humans. And whether you like it or not, we're all like 57th cousins. We're all a huge family. We create differences. We abstract them. We create divisions. We created racism. But not only are we all cut from the same cloth, we all come from the same place, maybe from a six-pointed star that reaches out forever. We are all cousins. Two with, um, in a way, we're cousins to the coral, to plants and animals. And this is another, this is the third um, 19th century botanical engraving that Asawa collected at Black Mountain College and kept her entire life. Asawa made a sculpture of that tumbleweed from Joshua Tree, which you can see here. It started with, a, I believe, a thousand, or many of these started with a thousand single pieces of wire that expanded um, by being divided into chunks a third. It's like 333, 333, and then again and again and again until there were just two at the edges, like maybe the Big Bang or like the genesis of humankind. There was always a root. And for Asawa, these roots are replicable. She's looking to not only wire and paper, but also to natural materials. She, for example, uh, would take these huge leaves, like this one from uh, the Sacramento Delta, and ink them and press them onto paper and leave their impression, duplicating the image, right? Replicating it, perhaps like mitosis in a way, making a twin, a double, like a shadow. On the right, you can see a potato print, as it's uh, as it's come to be called, uh, with branches in there. She's uh, carved a potato, I believe, and inked it and made this unique one-off, which is very beautiful. But two gets perhaps to the vegetal structures that I think she wanted us to see are everywhere. It's form is replicated. The same potato is printed again and again. Like, yeah, there's some duplication in here. Like, you know, yeah, but two, just a confluence and overlappingness of the same idea and orderedness even in the chaos. Asawa made works to on paper that embrace the material itself as a way to evoke the nature she hoped to render. And here is a work that is an example of that. It is um, a large work. In some ways, it feels that it's, you know, an 18 inch piece of paper. Uh, it's not tiny. 
And it has, you know, this ink that um, flows across it in this incredibly organic, fluid way, um, but that nonetheless um, evokes a tree, evokes the gnarled surface of a tree. As if she wants the ink to behave as a wood, because ink is in a way made from trees, right? It's, it's, it's burned wood that's, I think, that's turned to charcoal, that's pulverized into a powder, that's reliquified, that then goes across the page, which is also made of organic material, right? And so it's these, these carbon form, or carbon particles and fibers that interact with each other as they would, that in some ways repeat the nature of a tree, that in using these materials, she renders where they came from. And she says it herself in 1978, she says, I'm trying to make trees fit into the nature of the strokes and the ink and the paper. paper. The sycamore trees were the most ideal thing because they're gnarled. And here's the, here's the key. And where the paint puddles, it makes a knot. The paint behaves in its puddling like the gnarled branches. I went a teeny bit over, but we still have time for questions as we conclude the first part of this course on Ruth Asawa. A woman I think of as a kind of mother nature figure who could show us the underlying forms that make us all part of the same universe. And what a beautiful image of her um, drawing here to uh, send us off into um, questions, which I think we have several minutes for at least. Um, if you have questions, please submit them into the chat um, uh, with post haste and I will try to answer as much as I can. Um, we already have a number rolling in, I'll just get right to it. Was Asawa recognized during her lifetime? Uh, yes, she was. Um, she was collected by major museums throughout her lifetime. She earned several prominent commissions. Um, you know, there were some structural issues. She was a woman of color who, for example, applied like 13 times to the Guggenheim Fellowship and fellowship, Freudian slip, but who was all, you know, denied every single time. Uh, though I would argue she's probably one of the most qualified applicants almost every single time. Uh, you know, she... She uh, didn't have major museum retrospectives really until recently, and she died in 2013. So, um, you know, I've heard it. I've heard it said that the sculptures are quite delicate and they're hard to ship. I think that that may be a, a factor. Um, another question is: Can you share more about? Um, um, Okay, number of questions kind of amassing together. Um, okay, so what is the role of gravity in Asawa's work given her use of wire looped form forms? Are they stiff or malleable? They resemble netting. Does gravity give them their shape? That's a great question. Um, the sculptures appear in person to be very strong, um, but like paper, like her paper web she made, you know, they like spider web, they're they're actually quite delicate. Uh, they uh, they feign strength in some ways. I've heard they're a little bit brittle. Um, and they're quite light, um, I believe, uh, though I've never held one myself. Um, uh, and there there's certainly a play um in the works, especially the very long ones. I mean, many of these are huge, they, they can be, you know, eight feet tall or more, I believe, um, that can really pull down on the top lobes. So the top lobes can uh, kind of extend out, can pull down a little bit more than the bottom ones, for sure, yes. That's a great question. And, and to your point, uh, whoever asked this question about gravity, yeah, I do think, and I've never thought about it in this way, but thinking about how Einstein was on the, was on the, board of uh, Black Mountain College and was thinking very deeply about gravity, of course, and famous for that. Yeah, I think it's of a piece that Asawa's sculptures are free-floating kind of sculptural experimentations and 
how gravity affects matter in space and that are gossamer translucent that you can see through and kind of examine almost as as models they're kind of modular in that way um let me see what other questions are rolling in did she ever have a helper or helpers to make her especially large work that's a great question that we're definitely going to get to in the second part of this course and we'll talk about asawa's family um it ends up that asawa's i believe asawa's children helped make a lot of her sculptures um i've heard that one way to really connect with her because she was if you know Ruth Asawa, she was a doer. She was constantly like on her feet, doing things like making sculptures, you know, volunteering at the school, um, you know, connecting people, like doing all kinds of stuff, uh, doing side projects, drawing. Um, so in the kitchen with her husband, like she was constantly doing things. So uh, one way to kind of really pin her down and spend quality time with her, I think, was to uh, sit with her and crochet wire. And so I think a lot of her her wire sculptures were made in sort of semi-collaborations and family situations. Um, one good question here as we, we wrap up and maybe we'll just give it another minute or so, um, is that Asawa um, didn't name her pieces. And there's a question about, you know, is that a philosophical um, decision? And um, I, I do think it was, you know, it's such a Kind of a road tradition in contemporary art to just say untitled, right? Um, but I think almost all of Ruth Asawa's art is untitled. And I don't take that as thoughtless. I think that's a very insightful question from the audience member. I take it as a untitled as a as a kind of engagement with everything we've been talking about um this afternoon. That we give names to uh, differences, right? Um, we make up words that can hurt. And um, I think there's something powerful about disclaiming that language and embracing instead just the form that underlies all of us. And we'll get to this in the second part of the course, but Asawa wrote a letter to her future husband in 1948 uh, in which she said, you know, I, I no longer identify she said, Asawa, as Japanese or as American, but as a citizen of the universe. So there's a certain uh, there's a certain sense, especially in her early life, that um, at least to me, there seems to be a connection between identity and untitledness. And if I conflate those two things, you know, too bad. That's what I think. Um, and I think it's compelling. It's a great question. Um, okay, great. Well, thank you so much for your engagement and for the interesting questions on the chat. And um, I look forward to hopefully um, having you all join me in the pleasure of thinking about Asawa's lasting impact on artists, on design, and perhaps in our daily lives, um, which will be uh, on the 14th. So uh, coming up soon. Thanks so much, y'all. Thank you.